And so I spiraled at that point. I just got to a new city in Cambodia, it was. And um, yeah, emotions just started to spiral. I went through periods of real anger and hate and then desperation and sadness. Mm pain and it just perpetuated and got worse and worse. I tried to go to bed, I couldn't, I'd come down and probably for a four hour period I just had this intense emotion that was obviously painful. I just really didn't know what to do with myself. Luckily in the town I didn't know where the local bars were, I didn't know anything so I ended up as about two, three in the morning lying in bed and suddenly just dawned on me, why don't I pray? I've heard stories, I've been in church, I've heard stories about praying, I've heard mm. stories of God meeting you in your hour of need. So I just lay there, arms open on my bed and start to pray. And literally, as I turned my focus to God and prayer, I just felt this overwhelming sense of peace come over me, this sense of light, this sense of warmth, Welcome to What's the Story? My name is Matt Edmondson and this is a podcast full of stories about faith and courage from everyday people. And today I am chatting with the legendary Josh Burt about his Christian journey, challenges that he has faced and some of the lessons he has learned along the way. But before I get into all things like that, Josh, one of the things I love to do uh, is I love to just shout out about the sponsor of today's episode, which is Crowd Church. Yes, Crowd Online Church. You know as well as I do, not everybody wants to go to church and not everybody can get into a church building. And this is where online church works super well as it is a safe space to explore the Christian faith. And the thing that I love, 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 love about Crowd Church is that you get to join in and shape the conversation as they don't just talk at you. So if you've never been to church before, or if you're looking for a new church, check out Crowd Church. The website is www.crowd.church, uh, or you can email me directly at matt at crowd.church with any questions that you have. Yes, you can. So let's talk about Josh. Josh is, well, he's just an all-round top geezer. He is a husband, uh, a father to two beautiful kids and works as a physiotherapist at Older Hay Hospital. He used to be an avid cricketer, but let's not hold that against him. And he's also a big fan of LFC, despite the season not going that well. Uh, and before we hit the record button, Josh also said that he's just gone and deleted everything to do with Facebook. So I'm keen to dig into that. Josh, welcome to What's the Story. Great to have you here, man. How are you doing? Thank you for having me, Matt. Yeah, great to be here. Doing well, thank you. Good, good, good. And the, it's fair to, fair to say that uh, as we're recording this, the kids have just gone to bed. Will they Will they remain in bed or is it, is it touching yeah, down? No, they're generally good. They'll definitely stay in bed. Whether the older one shouts out for an extra little cuddle might, might happen, but uh, my wife's got that covered. Uh, <laughs> very good. How old are the kids? Uh, oldest one is four now, started school in September, and the uh, wow. youngest sister is two. Wow, so you've got very young kids, and you've. How long have you been married? Uh, coming up seven years in April. Yeah. Wow. wow. So you got the proper family going on now, haven't you? It's fair to say that the, I've known you for the longest time, and um, you've you've grown up in uh, what can only be described from the outside as quite a fun. But slightly lunatic family uh, that do you know what I mean with you've got your mum and dad who are just the most beautiful people on the planet, and then obviously there was a four brothers, um, and yeah, just uh, always always loved from the outside looking in, always looked at the Birch family and just thought it was fantastic. Was it actually like that growing up in the Birch family? Yes, it was. Yeah, three older brothers, always kept busy, always you know, striving to be at their level. I think it brought me on in, in my sports life in lots of things I did. I was always being challenged at a higher level for having three older brothers. And yeah, I loved it. As you said, my mum and dad are brilliant. Um, looking back on it now and being a parent, you can look back and see, you know, how blessed I was growing up to have such great parents, such stability and a, a loving home. So yeah, I look back at it with very fond memories indeed. 
Yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do. So you're, I, I, I mean, I know your mum and dad and you guys from uh, church. We, we sort of grew up in the same church. But did you, um, I mean, I, I obviously kind of know the story, but this is a podcast yeah. called What's the Story? So I think we should probably <laughs> share with everybody else. Did you grow up then in this Christian uh, home as a Christian? Uh, I'd answer that yes and no. In that, yes, it was a, a Christian household. My parents were all, always Christians. They became Christians in university and then obviously went on to have a family. So I, mm. I've only known them as Christians. Um, and definitely Christian principles throughout the home. We did always attend church and we moved up to Liverpool from Bristol to, to help with the, the planting of Frontline Church, um, which is a big church in Liverpool. Um, so yeah, I think I always had Christian beliefs. I always, I would always say I believed that there was a God. Mm. Um, but I guess growing up for most people, going through teenage years, you, you question a lot of things, you question life. I thought the Bible was outdated. I didn't think it was relevant to today. Um, you know, I thought certain practices in church you'd call hypocritical and this and that and kind of fell away a little bit. Um, through that stage, I then hit 16, 17, and obviously there's lots of other different things that come into life at that age, and many distractions, and yeah. would probably say I fell away, went to university, and yeah, I, 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 I wasn't living a Christian lifestyle, I wasn't in relationship with God, so yeah, I, I wouldn't have said I was a Christian, but would have still, I still believed in God, but there was mm. no, no relationship there. What does that mean to you when you say there's no relationship there? I think looking back on it now, and a lot of people describe it as head knowledge and heart knowledge. I think I had head knowledge from going to church, from listening to my parents, to you know, listening to preachers up on the stage about yeah. what Christianity is, who God is, you know, who Jesus is, and and what He did for us. Um, so I knew that, but I, I wouldn't say it was. It, it didn't have any emotional connection to me. That's probably the best way of putting it. I, it was head knowledge. I knew about it, but it hadn't sunk into my heart. I hadn't realized the significance of what that actually meant for me yeah. in my life in a, in a day to day way. Yeah. So what, so what happened then to cause that switch? Cause obviously, I mean, you go to church now, sorry, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously there was a, there was a change and there was a shift at some point. So what, what happened for you to go from this, this place of not being in relationship with God and head knowledge move into heart knowledge? So it was quite a um, pinpoint moment in time. Um, so I had finished university. I was in between jobs, just starting to get into my physio career. Um, and my girlfriend at the time I'd been with for five years, we'd had our ups and downs, but we're still together. We chose to go traveling. So we went out to Southeast Asia. Um, I couldn't actually uh, get out there at the same time she was because I'd just been offered a new job and I thought I'd take it anyway. I got to time, we went out there. Um, and actually, I think it was two weeks before I was due to go out there, we spoke on the phone and decided to call it a day. And oh, so wow. broke up, yes. Um, which looking back on it now was the right thing to do, but I'm kind of an internal optimist. I always look for the best in things and think, no, it'll get better, it'll get better, we can work on the Bible. Um, but anyway, we decided to call it a day. And so I ended up heading out to Southeast Asia for six weeks on my own, having just broken up from a five week, five year relationship. So not in the best headspace, shall we say, to, to go <laughs> start kidding, those yeah. travels. Um, Luckily, I had some friends out in Thailand that I met up with for the first couple of days, and that helped. And then anyway, progressively, it it just got more and more difficult to be on my own in that space. It only takes you having a couple of evening meals by yourself to kind of feel very alone, very vulnerable, mm. especially out in a, in a foreign country. Um, then while I was out there, I found out some information that I really didn't want to know about that kind of broke my heart um, and in the same instance got me very angry um, 
And so I spiraled at that point. I just got to a new city in Cambodia, it was. And um, yeah, emotions just started to spiral. I went through periods of real anger and hate and then desperation and sadness, mm. and pain, and it just perpetuated and got worse and worse. I tried to go to bed. I couldn't. I'd come down and probably for a four hour period, I just had this intense emotion that was just pretty can much I, overwhelmed. Um, can I ask what was the news that caused you to spiral? Yeah, um, basically, I, I was still able to log on to my ex-girlfriend's Facebook account and for some reason decided to log on and look at her messages, which showed that she had been with, with other men um, in that time. So, so, yeah, so found out that information. Right. Um, which yeah was obviously painful. Mm -hmm. um, so where was I? Yeah, so I went through that that pain, painful feelings, painful um, time. Was lying in bed, coming up and down, in and out um, of of the room, and just really didn't know what to do with myself. Luckily, in the town, I didn't know where the local bars were. I didn't know anything, so I, I thankfully didn't go down that route. Um, and then ended up as about two, three in the morning, lying in bed, and suddenly just dawned on me, why don't I pray? I've heard stories, I've been in church, I've heard stories about praying, I've heard mm. stories of God meeting you in your hour of need, so I just lay there, arms open on my bed, and start to pray. And literally, as I turned my focus to God and prayer, I just felt this overwhelming sense of peace come over me this sense of light this sense of warmth it i was almost taken back and i had to remind myself oh keep praying i want this to continue so i was like what on earth is this and just mm. it it was just amazing and when i think back on it now it does give me shivers it still just reminds me of how amazing that was um so yes, yeah, straight away I felt at peace. All that anger, all that tension, all that pain I was storing up inside was just released, it was gone. And then I carried on praying, I carried on talking to God, if you like, speaking to Jesus, feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit over me. Um, and light bulbs started to go off in my head. In, in our relationship, I think it was in the third year I had gone to Africa and I had cheated on um, my girlfriend then um, and I tried, I told her the truth eventually and we tried to work through it but it, it broke and trust, it made it difficult mm -hmm. and then having that same experience come back on me with the same girl just highlighted to me how painful that is and mm -hmm. it gave me a very valuable lesson to learn um, in terms of respecting women and your girlfriend's wife um a, a lesson that i hold to this day and and thank god that i i did learn that lesson because i i can completely appreciate the pain it causes now yeah. um and through all that i i i had emailed the girlfriend so to be fair to her she was amazing she traveled four hours on the bus the wrong direction because we had met up in in mm. camp where we were to come and sort out and speak to me so I think she was a, a bit nervous of what she was going to meet when she came and then to find out that I had, you know, experienced God through it all and found my faith and a personal relationship and forgave her and everything was was quite a shock to her at the time. Yeah, um, no kidding. Yeah. And yeah, now we're still friendly. It's all, yeah, there was, there was no grudges, if you like, held. Mm. And then I spent the rest of, rest of those six weeks traveling and... And that was the start of my personal relationship with 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 God, if you like. So, that's a heck of a story, Josh. Uh, finding yeah. God in Cambodia. Who knew he was there? Uh, you had to go all that way to find him, right? Um, and so, you've you you've sort of had this experience with God, as maybe would say in the church. You, you know, you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit there in your room in Cambodia, you sense God, you start to find your faith um, and reestablish yourself as a Christian over those weeks in Cambodia. Yeah. What was that phone call to mum and dad like? Because for five, six, seven years, you've not been 
living that way. Your your mum and dad are fairly, you know, they they've obviously got vibrant relationships with God, but and they're praying that you obviously discover Christ at some point in your walk with yeah. life. So what was that phone call like? To be honest, man, I don't I don't think I called them and told them. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think back. Do they do they know yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, they know the story. And I, I think this is also this was also the change for me in trying to change relationships within our family. Although from the outside, like you said, you looked and the Birch family was whatever you thought it was, mm. which it was in many accounts, but we were not. And yeah, looking back, we probably weren't in an emotional, healthy family in terms of there was the, the surface level emotion, but it, it wouldn't go that deep, if you like. If we had issues, concerns, you know, four lads, it wasn't sitting down with a box of tissues trying to get through it all <laughs> like no you know we'll yeah. just we'll get on with it we don't really need to say anything and that was kind of it especially for me as well when it came to girlfriends i i i used to pour my emotions into my girlfriends rather than mm. family parents brothers um so then when i broke up with a girlfriend i was kind of left with no one to talk to and i'd be like ah crap what do i do um so yeah, so it highlights to me that that lack of deeper, you know, emotional connection with my family, and and that was probably the start of me reaching out and trying to get a deeper relationship with my brothers and with my mum and dad. Mm. Um, so so yeah, I was I I probably I'm still not ever one to sit on the phone and chat for a while. So this is quite a new experience for me as well, Matt. To uh, <laughs> sit here for more than five minutes and actually talk to someone. Um, so yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, that was the start of me reaching out and trying to mm. create more uh, deeper relationships with my brothers and my parents. So yeah, in Cambodia, I, I wasn't on the phone the next day going, wow, yeah. listen to this. I think I was still trying to process it in my own head. Um, I did reach out to one of my brothers and tell him that I was struggling because I, I didn't even tell my mum and dad that me and my girlfriend had broken up before I went out there. I just mm. announced like via text while I was out there. And then amazingly, when I said, you know, three weeks in, I was struggling being on my own a bit. My um, one of my brothers just dropped what he was doing and flew out and met me and spent two weeks traveling around Laos oh, and wow. Vietnam. With me. So which was amazing. And yeah, yeah. Cherished that time to this day, which was great. Yeah, no kidding. So rewind before you go to Cambodia then. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm kind of curious, what was it like living as a someone who didn't really have a relationship with God in a house where your parents clearly did? Was there any, um, and I'm not looking for dirt here, Josh, I'm just, I'm aware that there, this is quite an obvious, uh, this is quite a common thing for a lot of people. You know, you've got Christian parents, but you're not a Christian. How do you, how do you find a way to live without winding each other up, you know, and that, that whole side of things. So what was it like? For you, yeah. I'm kind of curious. Um, yeah, no, it was good. And I think my parents soon realized they they couldn't push or force us into doing anything. Um, mm. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, there was no real conflict. They, they could see I was living, you know, a healthy lifestyle in terms of playing sport, in terms of having good relationships with friends and with girlfriends and stuff like that. that I, I wouldn't. I wasn't probably doing anything that they were worried about. Maybe some over drinking at times mm. and celebrating or whatever, um, but never to the point where we batted heads and that I couldn't be doing this in their house. Um, mm. And they would always just ask nicely, "Josh, do you want to come to church this morning?" And I'd make my excuses, but there was never any pressure or disappointment in me in doing mm. that. Um, which I guess looking back now as a father, it's hard because I think about my kids now and think, oh no, you know, you, mm. you think you know what's best and you want to try and push it on them. But yeah, I respect my mum and dad for doing that and letting us kind of almost find our own journey. And uh, I, looking back on it now and speaking to them, they were always praying for me. So, yeah. you know, they were always praying for me out when I was traveling or when I was doing mm. anything. And, you know, their prayers were, were covering me in that situation. Mm. 
Yeah. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because like you say, I mean, I've got kids, you've got kids, and you kind of you kind of think, I wonder how I would respond in that situation. And I, I, I part of me hopes I don't have to find out, you know. Yeah. It's that kind yeah. of... Um, but I, do you think, looking back on it then, now your mum and dad handled that situation well? Um, yeah, yeah, because I think if they pushed, I would have just pushed back harder. I, mm. I was 16, you know, finding myself... Sorry, 16 was probably the point where I fell away from going to church. I think in those early teenage years, they made us go because mm. we were kids, we were young. They didn't want to leave us in the house mm. on our own, whatever it was. They, they, they would tell us to come. Once we hit 16 and I had GCSEs, I used to use Sunday mornings while it was quiet to do my revision, my study. Mm. Um, and they would just ask nicely, do you want to come? Offer it, offer mm. it, offer it. Sometimes I would, sometimes I wouldn't. Um, but no push on it and they would pray and they would like us to get together and pray, you know, over certain situations. And again, a wood and a wooden. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think it was probably the right thing to do. Yeah. I don't look back on it thinking any regret or thinking things yeah, are going to yeah. be different. So yeah, no, I think it was the, well, I mean, it's obviously worked out well in the end, anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah you know. Definitely. So, um, so you come back to England. Um, you are a physiotherapist, like you say, at older hay, um, and you, you sort of get stuck into work. Do you start getting stuck back into church at this point? Yeah, yeah. So, came back. I started telling some friends and family. Um, started getting stuck back in. Well, started to get back into going to church. Um, and it was amazing. Those first few, I remember now going to church, like the first worship song I hear, it was like God was speaking directly to me. The first preach, I was like, man, is, does he know what's just gone on in my life? What he's <laughs> talking about is like resonating so strongly with me. I was like, who's tipped him off about this? And you know, the preacher and what he's saying. Um, it, it, yeah, it was just amazing for like that first month, just the, the head knowledge turned into heart knowledge and then all the light bulbs going off and what God was trying to teach me through my experiences so far and you know, yeah. you know the direction and where you want to take me and all this so it was it was an exciting time um so yeah I got stuck going got got back stuck into going into church and, yeah, and yeah. getting linked in with um community groups and different things yeah so what were some of the challenges you faced? Because you must have been, what, in your mid-20s, maybe 24, 25 at this point. And, and yeah. So what were some of the challenges that you faced about getting involved with church at that point that you had to sort of deal with? Um, I guess it was, it was striking the balance of, of still living in the real world, if you like, and, and being a part of the church and Christian lifestyle. Because yeah. one part of me was like, let's just leave my old life behind, get stuck into going to church, go to church football teams, go to church this, go to church that. And then I, I kind of felt God speak to me saying, no, that's not what, what I want you to do. I want you to be this new version of Josh, if you like, the new Christian Josh, but in your, still in your, in your life, still in my cricket club, still in my football club, still within yeah. work. Um, and, and if you like, be the salt and light within those areas, mm. try and bring, bring, you know, this newfound love of Jesus in, into those areas rather than just leave it all, which obviously then comes with challenges because they've known me for 15 years as Josh, the non-Christian, if you like. So suddenly yeah. I'm going in there being someone different and, and, and that, that's, yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> it definitely can be yeah there's no doubt and so um so how did you deal with that how did you how did you make that work um thankfully i'm not i'm not i i'm quite a confident person and i'm confident in who i am and i think that, again that's a blessing that my parents have bestowed upon me with, with the security they've given me in my, in my yeah. home and the upbringing um and I, I guess I was just honest with my friends. I was just honest and said, look, this is what I want to do now. I've tried that past life. They know what I've been doing. And I just said that that didn't make me happy. I found this that is making me happy. But I was still able 
to have fun with them. I was still like, for instance, the cricket is a big one. Um, within a men's changing room, there's many things said and done that aren't, yes, exactly uh, great ways to live your life or whatnot. Um, <laughs> not family viewing. Uh, you, exactly, not family yeah, yeah. viewing. Um, so I, I think it was a year or two years after I became a Christian, I got voted in to be the, the cricket club captain of the club. So then I could kind of impose my, not impose, probably a stronger word, but to, you know, I'm the captain. So what yeah. I says goes, if you like. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm running how I believe the team. And I was captain for the club for five years. Um, I managed to, to, yeah, change that that dressing room culture and 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 bring in a bit more family viewing, if you like, into 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 that situation. And I, I hope the lads looking back now and respected me for that and and found that um, a, a good in, intervention into the club and into the into the cricket team. Yeah, and it did, I, I built good relationships with them, and and it, yeah, it was a really good time. Well, very good. So looking back now, then you've been married, you said about seven years, which is a, a, obviously a, a different experience to uh, going out to Asia, right, where you've just broken up with your girlfriend. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of curious then. There's had to have been a change of thinking. Let me just put it that way. Right. You, there are some things you have had to undo in your head. Uh, where relationships are concerned, maybe how did how did you go about doing that? Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that was probably one of the other big challenges. Was as as I alluded to earlier that a lot of my emotional relationship came from being in with with a girlfriend. So yeah, I guess from the age of fifteen, I'd always been in relationships, um, and then suddenly. Uh, I was mid twenties in a career, starting to earn some proper money, and um, was then trying to live a, a Christian lifestyle and be respectful and all that with within relationships and trying to find the the right woman to um, to, to 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 go into a relationship with. Um, and very much felt this was a weakness or an area of weakness where I could be attacked, if you like. We talk, you know, the spiritual battle attack to the devil could, you know, really mm. get to me at, at this point. And looking back, there were lots of offers, lots of female interest. And I think, you know, as soon as I say, no, thank you. I'm trying to live this certain way. It almost makes it more of a challenge, and, and yeah. girls would 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 be even more attracted to you when you're not living that lifestyle, if you like. So that was that was quite hard for me to try and remain focused on what my end goal was, and not just enjoy the moment um, in that circumstance, if you like. Yeah, yeah. My fair That's play. Fair play. <laughs> so you, I mean, you're you're married to Alice now, who's just a beautiful lady, and we know and yes. love and adore. Um, yeah. But it's fair to say that. Um, well, why don't you just tell the story uh, about you and Alice? Because I think it's interesting, given where you yeah. come from, uh, what actually happened, and you ended up getting married. Yeah. So it's a yeah, it's a little mini testimony in itself. Um, for those that you that don't know, my mum and dad have a lovely old Victorian house, eight bedrooms. We've always grown up with lodgers and lots of people coming in and out of the house through the church, through various people. Sorry, um, it's probably worth just pointing out that lodgers to our American cousins is roommates. Roommates, they. I always get yeah. asked what's a lodger uh, when I talk uh, about having lodgers. So yeah, sorry, just translating. You crack on. Yeah, no worries. Um, so yes, yeah, so that, that that was our house. Um, what am I talking about? Yeah, so Alice. Alice was a family friend um, who my mum and dad knew better than me. She worked in the same school my mum worked. She was going through a tough time of her life um, and really just needed somewhere to stay because she had nowhere to live and fallen out with her parents. Various things was in 
well, she'll say the lowest point of her life. Yeah. Um, so she knew my mum and dad had lodgers, you know, took, took roommates in um, and asked my mum, can I just move in for two weeks to get myself sorted and, and then um, I'll move on. So my mum said, no worries. She came in. She ended up staying for four years. Um, <laughs> so yes, two, two, two weeks turned into four years, um, of which we were housemates, friends, got to know each other very well. Uh, when she moved in, obviously, like I said, she was in the lowest point of her life. This was only a few months after what I had just um, described in terms of mm. Cambodia and all that. So I was certainly not looking for a relationship or anything. I was just trying to get my relationship with God sorted first. So so that I was in a healthy place to then start a, a new relationship. Um, so very quickly, we just became friends um, and then got to know each other very well. We had both dated various people through that four year period that didn't work out short term. And we had friends and close friends always say, why aren't you two just going to start going out? Why aren't you two together? And we'd always look at each other and go, uh, no, no, definitely, no, no, or maybe no, because we just used to wind each other up. Um, <laughs> I find that it, hard to believe, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> and then it got to that four year point. I was being discipled by um, a great man, Mr. Marshall. Mm. Um, he basically just who's been on what's the story actually Uh, you can check out Al Marshall's episode yeah yeah the need to encourage men uh, ironically was the name of his podcast there you go very wise man who said Josh just make a list make a list of what you're looking for in your potential wife and and you know pray about that to God so I started making that list and I wrote it down and as I looked through that list I was like wow Alice ticks every one of those boxes I'm like, what is going on here? I was like, oh. And I used to treat her like my little sister. I used to wind her up, um, do unpleasant things like fart near her because I knew it annoyed her, all that sort of thing. <laughs> and yes, I used to wind her up a lot. So I thought, right, we were heading out to France for a holiday. I thought, let's let's change my re- re- um, response to her, if you like. Let's be nicer let's have better conversations let's engage blah blah blah. Mm. let's see because i I knew all these things but again it was all in my head i didn't have that that heart i didn't have that oh i love this girl if you like Mm. Mm. and literally within a week of doing that out in france i fell head over heels and like oh my goodness i really like this girl i really really like this girl um so came home from france sat in the bed and kind of asked her out and she just looked at me like almost scared and didn't say anything. I was like, oh my goodness, oh no, I've ruined it, blah, 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 blah. But basically she was scared because she had built such a good relationship with our family and my mum and dad and everything that if we didn't work out, um, she would lose all that. Yeah. But as I, as I always say to her, if we didn't work out, my mum would have kicked me out before she kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Which is so, probably quite true, actually. It no, is, it yeah, is yeah. yes. My mum always wanted a daughter, yeah. She had four boys, so Alice could have been that surrogate daughter. Yeah, yeah, no um, doubt, no doubt. So that and was so in that... the August. So we started dating in the August. In November, I proposed. She said yes, and in April, we were married. And wow. That was nearly seven years ago. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was there at the wedding, man. I have photographs and everything of uh, that yeah. beautiful, auspicious day. So, yes, no, beautiful. So um, so there's a great story, isn't there? A great story of redemption here, which um, brings everything full circle. But it's fair to say, uh, if I can summarise, Josh, after becoming a Christian, you had to work through some things before yeah. you could... Um, uh, go through that and I totally empathize with that because I was uh, I was the same way I had to for me relationships was the biggest thing because I didn't be, I didn't grow up as a Christian I became a Christian later in my life yeah. and I had to I had to relearn I suppose what God thought about relationships versus what I thought about relationships and it turns out my my thoughts about relationships were quite a little bit different to the good <laughs> lords. Um, yeah. And so I had to do that thing of what the Bible says, which is renewing your mind, isn't it? You had to change yeah. your thinking and um, and figure out, you know, his way uh, and, the, yeah. and the right response. So you and Alice get married. Is it all sunshine and rainbows since that day? Of course, Matt. Haven't you seen the Hollywood <laughs> movies? <laughs> We've lived happily ever after. Never argue, never do anything. 
No. Um, it, it, well, it's in, in terms of full circle, we actually have bought into the idea of communal living, multi-generational living. So we now live in this wonderful Victorian house with eight bedrooms with my mum and dad. Alice saw the vision of having lodges and helping mm. people out. She needed that help, you know, seven years ago. Sorry, no, seven, 11 years ago it would have been. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's been great. Obviously, living in a big household, newlyweds, and then with young children has its its issues, but the benefits far outweigh far outweigh the negatives. And we are definitely blessed to live with with great parents. And yeah. uh, we have foreign language students, and all different people come through the house, which is which is really really fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, with me and Alice, like with any relationship, it's you, you got to work at it to make it work. Um, mm. And and yeah, but it is has been a blessing. We've been blessed with two amazing kids. Uh, second born Ada was born with a congenital heart defect and Down syndrome, which we were told about at the twenty week scan. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously at the time that was devastating news, and it was a lot yeah. to work through. And I really I have so much empathy for people who have to have to go through that without knowing God because the support that we had from from the church community from our prayer yeah. life from from scripture from knowing that God was there through it all mm. it, it is what got us through um and we are blessed beyond belief to have this little girl in our life she is such a blessing just her smile lights up the room no oh, um, no doubt yeah yeah she's amazing um, she's very flexible too I'm oh always amazed at how she can get her legs into all those different <laughs> positions it's unreal well Alice is, is is flexible and then children with Down syndrome are known to be flexible as well right. so I think she's got her mother's flexibility along with the Down syndrome flexibility so she just yeah she just pops her legs out wherever <laughs> she wants and yeah it's crazy yeah. <laughs> it's proper crazy so um, and then to add, I mean, just to bring this sort of full circle, um, your your dad had a heart attack recently as yes. well, didn't he? Yeah, certainly did. That was a, a yeah, yeah. We were out in France um, this summer, and he's he's had some heart issues over the years. His dad unfortunately passed away at the age of sixty five. I think it was from a major mm. heart attack. I think I was six at the time. Um, and yeah, it was just me, Alice, the kids, mum and dad in France. And I was woken up at half seven in the morning to my mum screaming my dad's name, ran in to find him unresponsive on the bed. He, he pretty much had a major heart attack and was probably clinically dead, if you like, had passed away. There was no pulse. He wasn't breathing. His lips had gone mm. blue. Um, so we just shot into into defib mode if you like luckily I, I have done my um cpr training in work mm. um and five years ago i did a uh, enhanced cpr training if you like and decided to get a defib machine so that we could have it out in france because they're quite mm. um, isolated and remote out there um, so anyway, jumped to that mode. I started doing CPR on my dad. Alice called the um, called nine 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 or whatever the number was over in France, and my mum ran out to the van to get the defib machine. And all three of us working together managed to shock my dad back and get a heart rhythm. And then we ended up having eleven paramedics in the bedroom um, there to help um, pull him through. Uh, and yeah, and he's he's fine. He had two stents fitted in the French hospital and is now pretty much back to full health and is is in the house now watching TV, thankfully. <laughs> Causing mayhem yeah. and chaos still. Mayhem and chaos still, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it, it is amazing. And yeah, so so again the 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 support and love we got from our church family, well, everyone but mm church particularly with the prayer and support i was the, i mean the first thing i did was call nick harding who's one of my dad's best friends and you know a senior pastor um and just say while i was over my dad pretty much doing cpr just saying nick this has happened please pray please tell people to pray and hung mm -hmm. up and then 
just the, the, the I mean, that just spread then to yeah, well, ac- across the world. I think people in all corners of the world were praying just from Nick sending out a few texts and then it's spreading. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the stats say that I think it's one out of 10 people who have heart attacks outside of hospital setting make it. Mm. Um, so the percentages were against my dad, but thankfully through prayer and uh, God's blessing through, through me and Alice being there, because we mm. were due to drive home that morning and you know if it happened three hours later we wouldn't have been there and i think my mum would have struggled to do everything on her own the yeah. fact that we defib just loads of things you could go i could go into quite a lot of detail of how the lord had put in a lot of things over the yeah. years for, for that moment not to be my dad's last moment so yeah it's quite an amazing story we should probably get him on the podcast to talk about it at some point because it is quite an amazing yeah. story and i think public service announcement announcement defibs are are great uh, if you they certainly are know where your nearest defib is uh, is my yeah. top tip yeah. um but that was a stroke of i think i said to you that was a stroke of genius getting that uh defib at that time and it's only in hindsight that you realize isn't it actually that was a, a smart thing yeah so yeah. Josh, I'm curious as we wrap up the podcast, right? You've you've gone through this whole relationship thing, and you've come out of it the other end with a beautiful bride. Yeah. You have two beautiful kids. One, uh, your youngest daughter has Down syndrome um, and is extraordinarily flexible. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> your dad, um, who is the very definition of mayhem and chaos, uh, is is sort of you know mayhem and chaosing now. But that's a lot to go through. Right. Yeah. Um, for you personally, so I'm curious. In all of that, what's the learning? What's your sort of your takeaway? Your one message, if you like, that you've come away with, having gone through a whole a whole raft of stuff. Wow, that's a that's a big question. Um, uh, I guess looking back on it now, probably just focus on what you know to be true. And for mm. me, you know, taking that head knowledge to heart knowledge, I know Jesus is true, his teaching us are true, what he tells us is true. So so through those tough times, it would have been quite easy to try and do it, you know, to go through it by myself, to go, no, I'll do this by my own. But it, through sticking to his teachings, reading, praying, being in discipleship, being in community, you know, that's what's got us through all these yeah. times. Um, so sticking to what you know is true through, through the Bible and Jesus' teachings mm. and, and don't do it on your own. Yeah. Don't need to. Yeah, talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Speak to people. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Josh, listen, man, uh, there are so many questions and I wish I could get into it a little bit more, but um, unfortunately time is now currently against us. Yeah. No so... Problem. I just want to reach out to say thanks, man, for coming on to the, the podcast and sharing your story. Um, My pleasure. This is, is awesome. And it's great to see, having known you for a little while now, it's great to see you and the growth that you've gone on. And um, I thought you were going to say the great airs then. Like, oh, well, let's go with those as well. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be just a little known fact. Josh and I used to work out together and he could always lift heavier weights than me, which I was always slightly miffed about, except yeah. when it came to deadlifts. Uh, I always yeah. managed to do that. Uh, but shoulders was you, legs was me. And so, you know, I guess we balanced it out. Um, but no, it's 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 been awesome to see you grow and um, watch the story of Josh Birch unfold, really, <laughs> and totally inspiring the fact that you always got a smile on your face and a heart for people despite everything that's going on in life so it's been great getting you on man you're an absolute legend oh Thank yes you, you are your wife is beautiful too so you know you're a lovely couple and um, if you would like to reach out to josh if you want to connect with him you can do that through the crowd church website just go to crowd.church uh, and just connect with us through the little box and while you're there why not sign up to our newsletter uh, yes uh, and we'll send you all the notes and links totally for free so big thanks again to josh uh, what a great conversation uh, that was huge huge thanks you're an absolute legend now remember to check out crowd online church at www.crowd.church even if you might not see the point of church 
We are a digital church on a quest to discover how Jesus helps us live a more meaningful life. We are a community, a space to explore the Christian faith and a place where you can contribute and grow. And you are welcome at Crowd Church. Seems like Josh has got off. <laughs> I've just noticed that Josh has disappeared. He's just, he's just, normally people just hang around. Uh, he's obviously just didn't want to hear the end. Anyway, uh, be sure to subscribe to What's the Story, wherever you get your podcast from, because we've got some great stories lined up and I don't want you to miss any of them. And in case no one's told you yet today, you are awesome. Yes, you are. It's just a burden you have to bear. God created you awesome, created me awesome, created Josh awesome, who's, who was there, has now gone. Uh, <laughs> that's never happened before. Uh, was the story is produced by Crowd Online Church. You can find our entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app. The team that makes this show possible is Sadaf Bainon, uh, Josh Catchpole, Estella Robin, and Tim Johnson. Our theme song was written by Josh Edmondson. And if you would like to read the transcript or show notes, head over to the website www.crowd.church, where, as I said, you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and get all of this good stuff direct to your inbox, totally free. That's it. That's it from me. Thank you so much for joining us on the What's A Story podcast. I will see you next time uh, from me and from Josh who's disappeared. Bye for now. <laughs>